Uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ira Schwartz, recipient of our graduate fellowship, is a PhD candidate in the anthropology department at the University of Toronto. His research interests centered on pottery making communities of practice in the past and how this can be informative of social boundaries and identity formation. He's uh, particularly interested in the Chalcolithic uh, periods, if I pronounce it correctly, periods of the South Caucasus, the Southern Levant and Mesopotamia. Please join me a round of virtual applause to welcome Miss, uh, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, and now I give um, uh, floor to our speaker. Please, you can unmute yourself and the uh, floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Let me just uh, share my screen here, get started. Um, okay. And Okay, how are we looking? Can you, is everything kind of showing up properly? Awesome. Okay, so thank you so much, um, Talon and Diana, for having me and for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to talk a bit about the Gadotri Gora Regional Archaeological Survey, or GRASS, uh, which has taken place more or less since 2016, uh, with a couple of years of interruption there for potentially obvious reasons, um, in the municipalities of Marnuli and Gardabani. Uh, in the Kremlin Kartli region of the Republic of Georgia. Um, so our surveys over these years have found sites dating from the Neolithic through medieval periods, um, but the sort of real focus uh, of our survey is uh, kind of twofold. So the first thing that we're sort of very interested in is finding new Neolithic and Calcolithic sites in this understudied region and kind of dovetailing off of this, um, we want to take the results of our surveys, so the new Neolithic and Calcolithic sites that we find, um, coupled with Calcolithic and Neolithic sites found in neighboring surveys um, and those sites that are already known in this region. And we wanna combine this data to uh, develop a predictive model um, to aid in finding new Neolithic and Calcolithic sites in the future. So in talking about this uh, project and our research goals, um, first, I'll give just a very brief sort of regional geography um, and then sort of situate our survey universe within that regional geography. I'll then move on to talking about our predictive model, um, how we've put that together, um, some of our preliminary results and ways we'd like to improve it in the future. Um, then I'll sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about our survey methods. So starting with our remote sensing methods and then moving on to talking about our pedestrian survey methods. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about the finds from this past season, some of which are particularly interesting to me personally and hopefully to you as well. Um, and then some of our plans and hopes um, for the future of grass. So, um, I'm sure I don't need to explain to anyone in this room where Georgia is, um, but as is tradition with these sorts of talks, I'll just quickly uh, situate <laughs> the region. Um, so Georgia is bounded on the east by the Caspian Sea and the west by the Black Sea. Um, and it's situated between the greater and lesser Caucasus uh, to the north and south respectively. Um, our survey region is just to the south of the capital city of Tbilisi in the area that you can see outlined by this um, gold colored oval um, in the Marnuli and Gardabani, uh, Gardabani plains, excuse me. Um, and so just zooming in here, you can see the landscape of uh, Marnuli and Gardabani plains. Um, and our study region consists of sort of three main landscape types. Um, so we have a mix of lowland Pleistocene sediments um, that are in open fertile plains um, that are generally well suited to agriculture and grazing. Um, there are also downcut erosional depressions that were carved out during the Holocene uh, by the major rivers in this area, like the Kura, uh, the Khrani, and the Debeda rivers, as well, as well as the smaller tributary rivers that feed into these. Um, and there are also Cretaceous and Neogene uh, outcrops, excuse me, that form substantial semi arid. Uh, foothills in the sort of northern, western, and eastern boundaries of our survey area, um, with a couple of other uh, neogene outcrops, outcrops also in the neighborhood of Rustavi uh, and Gardabani as well. Because of this mixture of open fertile plains, numerous rivers, and semi-arid foothills, 
Uh, this region has acted as a junction for movement and communication in the past, uh, and it's been a strategic location for settlement since at least the Neolithic period, uh, but probably earlier than that as well. Um, these landscape features, these open fertile plains and these intersecting rivers and mountains uh, have meant easy access to upland pastures uh, and routes to highland sources of raw materials, uh, which we can see represented here uh, with obsidian, gold and copper sources uh, very nearby to our survey region. Um, the landscape features of this area have also meant that people and goods could travel easily both inter and intra-regionally um, since a very early date. Okay, so we can see here um, our survey universe um, outlined in these dashed lines and the area to the west in the red dashed line is what the original um, survey area of the Gadashuri Agora Regional Archaeological Survey um, was. Um, and then the area to the east um, we added in 2019 under uh, the name GAS. So this was the Gardabani Archaeological Survey. Um, but the project was essentially comprised of the same people, so we decided to just combine it under the umbrella of grass. Um, so we surveyed the area to the west, outlined in red, in um, 2016 and 2018. We surveyed the area in gray in 2019, uh, and we focused most of our efforts this past season on the area surrounded by this blue oval that you can see here. Uh, and the idea was to try to sort of bridge uh, these data sets a little bit by filling in some gaps uh, between these two regions. Um, so we took the data that we generated during these seasons of survey, um, and as I mentioned, coupled this with uh, data generated from neighboring surveys to the north and south of us, as well as um, already known sites. Um, and we've been using this data, and by data I mean identified Neolithic and Calcolithic sites, um, to generate um, our predictive model. So it's currently very preliminary, um, and for the calcolithic period model, it's extremely uh, bare bones, I guess is a good way to put it, um, just because we don't have nearly enough sites for the calcolithic period yet to put together a robust model. Um, but our Neolithic model um, has had some reasonably good success so far. So I'm gonna focus on discussing that for the time being. Um, so in making our uh, predictive model, we looked at survey data from all these different sites um, that are in the region. Um, and including places like Promise de Vigora and Aruklo, uh, Shulveri Gora, Gadashvili Gora. Um, and we identified that there were sort of three uh, commonalities or three main factors that seem to be um, influencing settlement location in this region. Uh, and that would likely be applicable to our predictive model. Uh, and so those three um, uh, attributes or commonalities were elevation, um, soil type and distance to water. Uh, so for each of these factors, we made maps in GIS uh, containing detailed information for each factor. So for example, we used DEMs um, to make elevation models. Um, we used hydrology maps to plot the locations of waterways, watersheds, uh, and floodplains. Um, and then of course we used pedology maps to uh, denote the location of various types of soils in the region. Uh, and then we overlaid this um, with the location of all these Neolithic sites um, that we knew existed in the region. And what we found was that, um, so all the Neolithic sites that we had um, sort of plotted in our predictive model uh, were located between 300 and 500 meters above sea level. Um, they were all situated on alluvial calcare soils or varieties of cinnamonic soils uh, that are ideal for agriculture. Um, and they were all positioned along smaller tributary rivers um, that flowed into larger rivers like the Kura and the Hrami, uh, rather than being situated directly adjacent to these larger rivers. And this is probably um, due more to taponomic processes and site preservation. So um, these larger rivers tend to flood and they've probably um, destroyed or buried um, older sites under deep levels of alluvial sediment. Um, so anyway, sort of digressing there. Uh, taking these three sort of um, attributes, you know, these elevation soil types and relationships to waterways, um, we then gridded um, our composite map into 50 by 50 meter squares, uh, and we gave each square uh, a desirability score from zero to three. 
uh, based on whether um, each square had um, any of these attributes, right? So for example, if a square had elevations between 300 and 500 meters above sea level, it would get a one. If not, it would get a zero. Um, if it was uh, situated, the square was situated um, on some of these desirable soil types, it would get a one, otherwise a zero. And then same thing with distance to water. Um, and we gave waterways a buffer zone of up to 350 meters um, because we were finding that not all sites were situated directly next to these waterways. Um, so we wanted to have a bit of leeway uh, just to account for variability. So if a site was situated along a waterway up to 350 meters, same thing, score of one, otherwise zero, um, for a potential score of up to three. Um, and these were unweighted. Um, so each one just got one point or no points. Um, and that's just because we can't actually account for what sort of social or cultural or other factors in the past might have uh, contributed to how these different things were, were valued or weighted. Um, so for us, we're just currently unweighted um, values for these different attributes. Maybe that'll change in the past as we have more data, but for now, that's the case. Um, and the result was uh, this map here, which, excuse me, which gives a sort of ranking visually to our survey area. And so you can see sort of a color-coded ranking, uh, the likelihood of us finding uh, a Neolithic site in a given part of our survey area ranked from high to medium to low. So a high probability area meets all three of these criteria, medium probability meets two of these criteria, uh, and a low probability meets one or zero of these uh, criteria. Um, so because we're still building our data set um, and to avoid confirmation bias, um, when we've been conducting our surveys, we are surveying in all three of these zones, so not just in high probability zones. Um, obviously, that wouldn't be particularly helpful in generating data if we were only going to the places where there was a really good chance of finding sites. Um, so despite the fact that we've got this sort of preliminary predictive model, we're still going out um, and um, exploring places that may not necessarily um, be in that sort of high probability um, zone or series of zones. Um, so currently we've plotted 27 Neolithic sites um, and of those 20 of them have been in high probability zones and the other seven have been in medium probability zones. Um, and then for the seven calcolithic sites that we've plotted um, in our predictive model, um, five of them were in high probability zones, one in a medium probability zone and one in a low probability zone. Um, so, so far, not too bad. Our results have been okay, um, but we still have obviously a lot of work to do, um, mainly just increasing that data set, going out and finding more sites um, and sort of fine tuning these different parameters um, to make this as precise and accurate and robust as possible. So switching gears a little bit, I'm gonna now uh, just talk about our survey methodologies. So starting with our remote sensing and then going on to pedestrian surveys. Um, so, in order to plan our surveys, we begin first by looking at Landsat 8 um, and Corona satellite images. So Landsat 8 is just Google Earth. Um, and what we do is we basically um, take a Google Earth uh, satellite of our survey region and we just meticulously scan the region looking for um, things that we suspect might be archeological sites. So we're looking for things like um, soil discoloration, uh, rounded protrusions in the landscape, um, or other anomalies um, that could be things like goras or, or just archaeological sites in general. And every time we find one of these, we'll drop a pin on it, um, get its coordinates, um, and then we'll outline a polygon around it. So a polygon, just sort of a, an abstracted line around this suspected site. Um, that we want to go and survey. It's the area that we want to go and survey. And it can be um, the boundaries of a farmer's field or something completely um, sort of arbitrary that's just sort of, you know, a certain buffer zone around what looks like a site just to make sure we feel like we've kind of covered the area um, adequately or whatever. Um, but in doing this, we've kind of come across two major problems. Um, so the first one is that it can be exceedingly difficult uh, to identify sites that are situated within towns or villages. 
Um, this is because of um, a lot of tree coverage and buildings and roads and just other stuff that's on the ground can make it quite difficult to identify sites uh, via satellite. And then the other issue that we've uh, come across is that sites that are in fields that have been plowed repeatedly for decades um, can be extremely difficult to identi identify via satellite imagery because they're basically um, plowed right down to surface level and if not entirely obliterated. Um, so this is where corona satellite images have been effective for us. Uh, they've been really helpful um, because of their age. They were taken from the 1950s to the 1970s. Um, they allow us to see a less developed landscape. Um, so in a lot of instances, we can see sites that have not yet been sort of engulfed uh, by towns or villages. Um, and the other thing is that um, farms where sites have been, are located haven't been plowed for nearly as many years. So they're a little bit more visible in the landscape. Um, and then the other thing that's great about corona images is that um, anthropogenic soil disturbances, um, they show up in these images as bright, um, sort of white or light gray spots in the landscape. Um, and that makes it much easier to identify sites. So if you look at the images on screen here, for example, um, on the top right in the Landsat 8 image, um, it's quite difficult to point out where any archeological sites might be in this town. Um, and if you look on the top left image, um, they kind of stick out as these bright white images or bright white uh, spots in the landscape. Um, I've got two of them uh, sort of noted on here, but I think there might even be a third one just to the north of the, that big site there. It's much clearer than it would be uh, in the top right image. And then same with the bottom two images. On the bottom right, we've got Landsat 8, um, where these are, and these are sites. These are sites that we went and ground truth, so they are actually sites. Uh, and then the bottom left image is just much more clear than it is in the uh, uh, Landsat 8, 8 image. Um, so combining these two uh, image sets, Landsat 8 and Corona, um, we've been able to plot 294 um, polygons, sort of preliminary locations with their GPS coordinates, uh, which we've spent the last few seasons uh, sort of gradually, systematically ground truthing. Um, so when we go out and we do our surveys to ground truth, um, these sort of points of interest that we've identified via satellite imagery, um, we sort of conduct our survey in one of two ways, depending on the terrain, depending on the landscape affordances. Um, we either do transect walks uh, or we do random walks. So transect walks we do pretty much in open fields um, where we can walk parallel to plow scars or in places with fairly level ground and good ground visibility. And when we're doing our transect walks, we tend to space ourselves about five meters apart um, in this in our sort of experience has given us pretty good control of our sweep widths. Um, and we walk one meter segments, take a break, walk another, or sorry, 100 meter segments, take a break, walk another 100 meters uh, until we've completely covered the entirety of our survey polygon. And we do these 100 meter segments uh, just to reduce, reduce observer fatigue uh, and try to make sure that we're kind of being consistent um, in our ability to identify artifacts. Um, so in circumstances where, um, the ground is uneven terrain, or there's poor ground visibility, or there are buildings or other sort of um, obstacles in the way, we'll do random walks. Uh, and in this case, we will take a polygon and subdivide it into subsections. Um, and then one to two surveyors will intensively walk uh, within those subdivisions of the polygon um, and note uh, or, or collect uh, whatever artifacts are found. Uh, and we do try to do total collection in our survey polygons. Um, however, in instances where uh, artifact density is, is too high to uh, make total collection feasible, uh, what we do is we have these like sports clicker things, uh, like I guess tally counters might be another way to put that, uh, to call them. Um, and we will uh, count all of the observed artifacts that we see uh, and only collect diagnostic pieces. So things like rim shirts, decorated shirts, uh, bases, uh, obsidian tools, etc. Um, and then, of course, either way, whether we collect everything or not, um, all artifacts are given um, a detailed uh, description of their find location. Um, and we also do whenever we can take an MLID, uh, which is basically a very precise and accurate GPS unit, 
um, and we point plot um, where we find our artifact scatters and, and high densities of artifacts. And this allows us to later build um, artifact density maps um, so that we can kind of get this high degree of spatial control, ideally, uh, over where different artifacts have come from and how artifact density is dispersed across uh, the landscape as well. So in total so far, we've surveyed 205 of our polygons. Um, and within these polygons, we've found 207 sites uh, spanning from the Neolithic through medieval periods. Um, and some of these polygons have multiple sites in them. Some of them have no sites in them. Um, and of the sites that we found, 93 of them have been Kurgans. Uh, and Kurgans are basically earthen or, or stone burial mounds. Um, and the vast majority of these have been uh, clustered in the eastern part of our survey universe, surrounded by this blue oval here, um, sort of right on the boundary between um, some of these neogene uh, semi-arid foothill outcrops um, and the lower sort of fertile um, uh, uh, Gardabani plain, excuse me. Um, as you can see, there's also sort of a major dearth in sites just to the east of the Kura River. Um, there's a couple sites there that you can see these are located on those neogene outcrops, outcrops that are right in the middle uh, by sort of Rustavi and, uh, and Gardabani. And these are late Bronze Age and Iron Age sites. Um, but there have been, at least that we've found, uh, no Neolithic sites or earlier period sites in this area besides on these sort of higher outcrops. Um, and this is something that we've been uh, hoping to explore in our uh, in our research. So um, we have some ideas about why this might be. Um, so basically, the original route of the Kura River was much further to the east than it is right now. So if you look at the top of this map, you can see that, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the route of the Kura kind of goes here and then takes a turn to the right. Can you see my mouse? Is that visible? Um, if not, anyway, you can probably see where it sort of starts off going to the right. Um, and it was flowing towards uh, Jandara Lake. Um, but then during the late Miocene uplift, when the central Anatolian uh, plate kind of was raised up, the route of the Kura River began to shift towards the south and to the west. Um, and over time, um, as the Kura moved, we suspect that um, it has erased or buried older period sites um, beneath, beneath meters and meters of alluvial sediment. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to test this season was whether that was the case. Um, and we had planned to place a series of seven meter deep cores across our survey universe to get a sense of sort of what was happening uh, across this span of, of land and, and as the Kura kind of moved across the landscape. Um, so unfortunately, um, the team member who was gonna take the lead on this for us this season got COVID just before our season. Um, we were unable to do these seven meter deep cores this season, um, but it's something that we would still really love to do next season. Um, and, you know, hopefully uh, once we can accomplish this, we'll be able to get a better sense of how the movement of the Kura has affected site preservation in this region uh, and get a better understanding also of how various environmental and climatological processes um, have impacted choices of settlement location over time as well. Um, so getting a sense of how the climate and the ecology and the environment in this region has changed over time using the sediment profiles um, and seeing how this corresponds to site location um, because there is this sort of shift that we see from the Neolithic through the Calcolithic uh, where Neolithic sites tend to be clustered in these sort of lowland fertile, uh, fertile areas. Uh, and then at least in the first parts of the, uh, in the Calcolithic period, it seems like there's a movement towards uh, these highland areas, these semi-arid, um, kind of foothills where soils are a little bit thinner and a little bit less conducive uh, to the types of agriculture that were being practiced in the Neolithic period. Um, okay, so switching over to talk about the results of our survey so far this season, or so far the season's over, uh, survey results from this season. Um, I mentioned earlier that we've identified 27 new Neolithic sites. Um, and all of these sites have been situated on goras of various sizes and shapes. Um, so agora, in case you're not aware, is basically 
um, an anthropogenic mound that's created from prolonged habitation of a site. Um, basically, as people live in the same place over time, um, and they discard their garbage and they demolish their houses and rebuild their houses and basically all the things that come with people living in the same place over time, the ground level is gradually raised. Um, and so all of the Neolithic sites that we've found so far have been situated on goras of various sizes, sizes and shapes, uh, but they've generally been fairly low lying and either somewhat elongated or, or oval in shape. And each of these sites has had an abundance of pottery, obsidian, uh, and in most cases, many grinding stones, all of which are very typical uh, formally of uh, the Shulavari Shomo culture, which is the Neolithic culture that is present in this region. Um, so here's some examples of some of our finds from this past season. So just in the top left, I put together a plate of some of the diagnostic ceramic forms um, that we found. Um, and for the most part, these are low, occasionally medium fired pot, pots with um, these sort of rounded, simple rims. Um, and they're generally whole mouth pots with the occasional bowl. Um, and in the bottom left two images, you can just see a couple examples of some of these diagnostic features of the Shudavre um pottery that we found. Um, so the basket and pressed base in the bottom left, is very common, um, Shudavre uh base. And it's just produced from, um, building a pot basically on a woven mat that's used to turn the pot um, as it's being built. And the result is that it leaves an impression on the bottom of the, of the vessel. And then to the right of this image, um, two examples of um, a very common uh, um, decorative style, which is these applied uh, ceramic knobs and then generally sort of situated around uh, the vessel just below the rim. Um, as far as lithics are concerned, the vast majority of lithics that we found on these Neolithic sites has, have been obsidian, um, mostly flake and, and blade tools with very occasional cores. Um, and very rarely, we've also found some flint or chert on these sites. Uh, and this is very much typical of the Neolithic uh, in this region that there's a strong preference for the use of obsidian for tool making. Um, and that flint is sort of uh, much less common. Uh, and then in the top right, uh, just an example of sort of how many grinding stones we've been finding on some of these Neolithic sites. So there's, uh, I think, about a dozen from this one site. And, and this was sort of the case across the board. We were finding many grinding stones, uh, most of which are made of basalt with the occasional limestone grinding stone, but just sort of illustrative of uh, the importance of, of agricultural production uh, during the Neolithic period in this region. And then in the bottom right, um, we've got something that was a really pleasant surprise for us to find on survey this season, uh, which is a small abstracted anthropomorphic figurine. Uh, and this figurine bears a strong resemblance to a similar figurine found at nearby Aruklo. Um, and, you know, it, it just has so much in common with it from uh, the overall form to the posture to even the sort of punctate uh, impressed uh, decorative motif. Uh, and this is a ceramic. Um, and, you know, there's a striking resemblance to this particular example from Aruklo, but these are also found at other sites, uh, sort of in our immediate vicinity. Uh, they come from, there's a, there's a number of examples from uh, Kramis de Gora, uh, from Shulavari Gora as well. Uh, and these are also sort of very diagnostic of, uh, of the Neolithic in this period. So that was just an exciting find for us and sort of a rare thing to find on survey. So moving on to the Calcolithic period, and this is sort of the stuff that I find particularly interesting. Uh, and it's all very interesting, but I love the Calcolithic period. Um, and this season, we had a really nice sort of very pleasant surprise from one of our Calcolithic sites. So we only surveyed two Calcolithic sites this season. They're sort of slim pickings for us in this region so far. Um, so gas 118 in the sort of Northeast uh, appears to be a local calcolithic site, maybe Sioni or Tsopi, uh, sort of cultural attribution, if you if you want to go down that route, as problematic as those kinds of attributions are. Um, and it's basically just a flat uh, possible habitation site situated uh, directly adjacent to a Kurgan of unknown date. And this Kurgan seems to have been built directly on top of where this calcolithic site was. 
Um, and it sits right on these sort of this interface between these thinner, more anemic soils that are less conducive to agriculture. Um, and this sort of fits in with what we what we know of uh, local coccolithic sites from this region uh, that they tend to be a bit more ephemeral, um, situated sort of up in these highlands. Uh, and we don't know exactly what the cause of this is. Uh, potentially, uh, we're looking at changes in subsistence practices um, or changes in climate or environmental conditions that um, sort of influenced people's decisions for where they settled. Um, but of course, this is just speculation. And then the other site, site 113. Uh, so this is the one that was really exciting for us this season. Um, so we initially visited this site last year um, and we surveyed it and found um, an absurd amount of almost exclusively uh, a type of pottery that's called chaff-based ware. Uh, so we suspect that this is a um, late Calcolithic, late Latepe period site, um, which would be very significant uh, for Georgia. Uh, and really exciting for us if it in fact is the case. Um, before I get into too much detail about that, I'll just sort of explain what Leila Tepe uh, may be first, uh, just so that this all kind of makes sense. Uh, so around the tail end of the fifth millennium and into the first half of the fourth millennium, uh, BC, of course, uh, there seems to be um, an influx or a, an escalation of interaction between the South Caucasus and Mesopotamia. Um, and the idea that's sort of generally put forth in the literature um, is that um, Mesopotamians are coming to the South Caucasus um, to gain access to resources. So namely metals, uh, semi-precious stones, uh, things like obsidian as well, and basically exchanging and trading um, with local groups for these materials. Um, and it seems that over time, people are from Mesopotamia, or at least with a Mesopotamian um, cultural uh, orientation, are settling in the South Caucasus uh, and sort of mixing with local populations. Uh, and the result of this is that they're creating a new uh, sort of material assemblage that we call Leila Tepe. Um, and, and I just want to be very clear when I refer to Leila Tepe, I'm just referring to this material assemblage. I don't want to make any leaps and start talking about cultural affiliations or ethnicity or anything like that, just sort of the repertoire of, of, uh, of material culture, the assemblage. Um, but sort of um, in this period of time, sort of from around 3800 BC to around 3500 BC, we see the emergence of this new repertoire of material culture. Um, and most of these sites are located in Azerbaijan, um, which is sort of why this is exciting for us. Um, but the hallmarks of this sort of Leila Tepe culture um, are an interesting melding of, of the South Caucasus and Mesopotamia. So on the Mes Mesopotamian side of things, you've got these like child jar burials, um, the use of clay sickles uh, for agriculture, whereas local um, agriculture has, tends to be, uh, sorry, local sickles tend to be made of obsidian. Um, you've got this sort of um, increase in the number of stamp seals in the region. Um, you've got the incorporation of more Mesopotamian sort of ceramic forms into the ceramic repertoire. Um, and that's sort of the main thing that we find, obviously, uh, in our surveys. We haven't really been finding things like jar burials and stuff because we're not excavating. Um, and then, of course, the incorporation of Mesopotamian architectural styles a little bit into the repertoire as well. So the local calcolithic um, architectural repertoire is, is quite eclectic as it is. Um, and then sort of towards the Leila Tepe period, you get the incorporation of this more sort of rectilinear uh, mud brick architecture that's very typical of Northern Mesopotamia. Um, and all of this stuff is very, very similar to material from places like Tel Brock and Hamilcar. Um, and this image on the right here uh, is of Berkov Dibi. And this is the sort of one for sure known, or maybe not for sure isn't even fair, the one likely um, Leila Tepe period site in the South Caucasus, or sorry, in uh, in Georgia, the rest of which are in Azerbaijan. Um, and this site is sort of, I guess a public building is the best way to put it perhaps. It's been referred to as a sanctuary or as a temple, but I kind of prefer the more neutral terminology when discussing it. Uh, but it's one building uh, without an associated settlement. Uh, so the idea that we've got this Leila Tepe settlement that we've found on our surveys is very exciting for us because it would be just the second Leila Tepe site 
uh, in Georgia and potentially the first um, settlement site in Georgia. Um, so here is some of the material culture that we've found on survey uh, of this particular site. And I'll show you what the site looks like in just a moment, but this is just to sort of situate everything contextually. Uh, so um, in the top middle, um, this shaft-based ware rim that's very, very um, sort of typical Lela Tepe, very Northern Mesopotamian in style um, with this sort of right angled rim that you can see here. That's a very common sort of Lela Tepe form. Um, the chaff-based uh, chaff ware fabric, which is a sort of low to medium fired fabric, tends to be very orange in color. Um, and its main characteristic is that there's an abundance of vegetal temper in the fabric. So um, the clay is tempered with uh, plant material. Um, and when the clay is fired, um, this plant material burns off and you get these very typical sort of, they look like dashed lines sort of all up in the pottery. Another sort of common Leila Tepe fabric is this sandy grit mineral tempered fabric, uh, which we've been finding very much in conjunction with this chaff based wear. Um, and then occasionally we also came across more sort of typical local calcolithic pottery, uh, like the example uh, on the top left of this slide, which is um, this sort of incised lip of the sherd. So um, that's the top of the pot that you can see there. Um, and it would have had these sort of incisions all the way around the rim. Uh, that's very sort of typical of the local calcolithic pottery uh, from this region. And finding a bit of a mix of local and Lila Tepe pottery is also very common at Lila Tepe sites um, because it seems like for the most part, with the exception of a few sites like Lila Tepe itself or um, uh, one or two other sites in Azerbaijan, uh, there tends to be quite a mix between these sort of local uh, materials and um, and more Mesopotamian influence materials. Um, so here's the site itself. Um, so it's situated directly adjacent um, to a derelict channel of the El Gedi River um, on this sort of alluvial fan um, that's sort of rising out from just, just to the side of a bend of the El Gedi, of the, this derelict channel of the El Gedi, excuse me. Um, there used to be a slaughterhouse situated on the site uh, during the Soviet period but that has since been abandoned and it's completely destroyed and sort of rubble strewn across the place. Um, the site is also cut by a canal, which has been extremely beneficial for us because it's allowed us to kind of peek into the stratigraphy of the site without having to excavate. Um, and you'll notice perhaps uh, just to the west of that canal cut, there's a slight rise in the landscape. And we suspected when we surveyed this initially last season that this might be uh, a logora. And that was really interesting for us. So. Last season, we did some very intensive survey of this site um, and we made a uh, artifact distribution map uh, to get a sense of sort of how artifacts were spread out across the site, where they were most dense, et cetera. Um, and the result of that was uh, that there was a lot of artifacts, a lot of pottery um, towards the Northern part of that tell there and in the field that you can see kind of in the bottom right of the dashed oval. Um, and because of this, this season we had hoped to excavate two three by three meter squares on the site, uh, one here um, and one right here. Um, but because of some unforeseeable complications, I'll say uh, we were unable to excavate those units this season. Um, another thing that we wanted to do that we were able to do this season uh, was placed some smaller one and a half meter deep cores across the site to get a sense of the depositional sequence here. And I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so last season I mentioned, so we did an intensive survey of this site um, and this canal cut afforded us kind of a peek into the stratigraphy of the site. So last season we cleaned three sections along the course of this canal cut. Um, and from south to north, um, what we were finding in these sections very, mu very much matched up with the uh, artifact density map that we had made. So from south to north, the amount of pottery we were finding in these sections was increasing towards the, the tail area here. Um, and that was sort of mirrored in our artifact density map, um, which is why we really wanted to excavate this sort of northernmost square because there was just um, a bunch of pottery kind of coming out of this section and also just right on the surface. Uh, another thing that was really interesting, of course, that we found at basically like the last 
<laughs> it's always the last day of working on a site, um, was uh, what appeared to be just the edge of a habitation surface. It looked like maybe a floor uh, or something like that. Uh, we were unsure what it was, um, but then our season ended um, and we were very, very excited to be able to come back next year uh, and potentially excavate this. But then of course COVID happened um, and two years went by before we were able to return to the site. Um, so this past season, this summer, we were very excited to go back and be able to do this excavation. Obviously we were a little disappointed that we weren't able to excavate, but we were kind of greeted with a very pleasant surprise when we came back and cleaned up the sections that we had excavated last season. Uh, so to our delight, um, when we cleaned out all the material that had kind of accumulated in this section from last season, um, a lot of the sort of walls of the section had eroded away over the past two years. And what we were greeted with this season was two nearly perpendicular uh, mud brick walls um, and one nearly intact um, sort of fallen mud brick that was just to the, to the right of these walls. So you can see um, on the dashed line uh, that's sort of going north south here, roughly north south. We last season kind of um, chipped away a little bit at this wall because we didn't really know what it was and we were just sort of cleaning up the section. But the actual line of the wall is quite straight. Uh, you can see it just sort of to the right of the area that we uh, unfortunately kind of uh, scraped away at. Um, and this was really, really interesting for us because it confirms that there is architecture on this site. Um, and it's been very encouraging for us suggesting that we might actually have this Leila Tepe settlement, Leila Tepe period settlement uh, here at this site. Um, so finding this architecture, uh, we decided to put another core basically smack dab in the middle of this section. And this core told us the same thing that these other cores that we placed around the site told us. Uh, so first of all, below this level, below where we've got this architecture, there is seemingly just nothing. We did not, none of our cores turned up a single potsherd, piece of obsidian, uh, bone, or anything at all. It was completely sterile below this level. Um, and every single one of the cores was homogenous for one and a half meters. Um, and they pulled up just extremely fine alluvial silt. Uh, so this suggests to us, again, that this is a single period site um, that was placed basically directly on top of uh, this alluvial fan that was created probably um, by the repeated flooding of this channel of the Al Getty as it sort of meandered around this band, basically. Um, so this architecture coupled with the immense amount of chaff base wear that we found here. Um, I should also mention that the lithics were far more skewed towards being flint and chert than they were towards being obsidian here, which is also very encouraging for the idea that this might be a Leila Tepe uh, site. So all of this suggested to us that we might have something really cool here um, and we're hopeful and excited to be able to come back in a future season uh, to, to properly excavate this site. And speaking of future seasons, um, what we'd like to do next season or, or sort of as, as we're able to is A, continue pedestrian survey of our region to keep sort of adding sites to our predictive model so that we can continue refining this predictive model um, making it more robust, more and more accurate. Um, we'd also like to actually be able to do these seven meter deep core samples across our region that we were hoping to do this season. Um, I mentioned some Kurgans sort of very briefly. Um, we would like to go and excavate one or two of these Kurgans in a future season. Um, there's a Kurgan field to the southeast of us called uh, Soyuk Buluk, um, and there they found a number of these ringed kurgans are sort of low stone rings and they were hypothesized to be calcolithic in date. We have a number of those in the Eastern portion of our survey universe that we'd like to excavate to confirm the periodization of. Um, and then finally, we would like to be able to actually excavate a couple of these three by three meter uh, units at this site, GAS-113, to confirm whether it is or is not, in fact, uh, a Leila Tepe site. Uh, and that's it. Yeah, thank you so much for listening.